Today we're discussing a line of new lighting products from iFootage. And if you're anything like me, you probably heard that and thought, wait, there's gonna be yet another player in the lighting game. Do we really need that? But I quickly changed my mind about them when I actually received and started testing these lights. They are excellent and offer more quality per dollar than most of the other options out there at the moment, which I suppose should be no surprise considering just how fantastic a lot of the other products from iFootage are, like their monopod and friction arms. So today, we're gonna take a mostly unscripted look at these new lights, but first, I need to provide some disclosure. iFootage sent me these lights for free to make this video. They also compensated me monetarily to produce this video and prioritize it to release alongside their launch. Because of this, I'm not declaring this video an official review, but more of a showcase. But I made them aware that I'll still be voicing any criticisms I have with these lights to you, and that they won't be able to preview my video before I post it, and they were okay with that, which I think speaks to their ethics and product quality. The way I approach sponsored content is that I don't agree to make the video regardless of the money offered if I don't think the product is worth recommending to you, and I don't discuss sponsorship rates until after I've tested the product to see if I'm willing to cover it. And in this case, I really like these lights, so I was happy to get paid to prioritize the creation and scheduling of this video. But ultimately, it's up to you to decide if you think this content is useful and reasonably objective. Lastly, just a reminder to be vigilant about comment spam on YouTube. Comments from me will always have a verified check mark, and there are no prizes or giveaways on this video, so any comments suggesting that are fraudulent and should be reported. Okay, now let's talk about these lights. As you can see, I have sort of a messy shot today compared to what I normally do this because I'm gonna do all the tests and everything for you on camera here, and like I said, mostly unscripted. So we've got three different COB lights, and then there's also a little pocket LED we'll talk about for the three COB lights, they come in three different intensities or powers or sizes. Uh, this one here is the SL160DN, which is their smallest little 60 watt light. And then we have two larger ones. This one is the SL120DN, so that's a 220 watt light. And then finally this one, which is the largest, is the SL320DN, a 320 watt light. Now both of the 320 and the 220 are basically identical when it comes to the control box, the layout, the cables. Pretty much everything like that, it's just the power that's different. But the 60 watt is quite interesting and quite different. And it's my favorite little 60 watt COB on the market. And I would argue it's the best one when it comes to build quality and feature set because often in this category, you either get a big chunker one to be metal and, it, and it's sort of a strange light that has limitations or you get a nice value one that's small but it's made of plastic. This one is a nice blend between all, it's all metal construction, all three of them are. and. The powering options are great. So the interface is very simple, as you can see, we just have the two knobs and a screen, power button, and then two different power sources. We have the DC plug and we also have USB-C. So what's great about this is you can use the DC plug. There's a DC power adapter that comes in this carrying case here that you can use to plug into the wall for mains power. But there's also some accessories that iFootage provides that you can use in that same DC plug. So one would be this, for example, which is a V-mount handle for your light that has the little spigot on top there. So you would loosen off the yoke. And the yoke is actually pretty strong on this for it's all the pieces are metal. So you just slide it into this little spigot attachment here and then you can lock it down. I'm sure you can intuit where we're going with this. And then you plug this into the DC port and then you slot a V-mount battery in the front here. And then you get a little, you're Hollywooding a little 60 watt light with the, uh, with the V-mount battery. And this uses a mini Bowens mount, which they have an adapter for, as you can see. You would put the light on here for the mini Bowens and then you could attach your regular size modifiers that would use for the Bowens mount. But now the USB-C port is something I wasn't expecting. If you have a 100 watt power delivery USB-C power bank, like the one I have here from Zenjur, so you just plug this into USB-C, turn it on. I don't know what setting we're at here. So we're at 50% power, so we're just gonna turn the left knob here to turn it down, turn it slowly, it moves slowly, turn it aggressively, and it goes down quite quickly for you. And then the right one is for changing functions in the menu and that kind of thing. But anyway, it tells me the power draw rate on my Zendra device here that you can probably see here when it's off. And then as we turn the power up, you can see how much power we're, we're gonna draw here. So if we put it at say 20%, then now you can see that we need about 17 watts and if we go up to, I'm just over half now, you can now see that it needs 44 watts or so, and at 100% power, almost at 80 watts. So it says they need 100 watts, but seemingly you can get away with 80. But how cool is this? We've got a 60 watt COB running just on a USB-C power delivery device. 
I, I'm a big fan of this. Now I'll show you the effects on the light, but I'm going to not enable them just so that the flashing lights doesn't bother any of my viewers. But hopefully you can see here, fireworks, lightning, paparazzi, welding, strobe, explosion, pulsing, and faulty bulb. Now these are obviously just daylight effects. There's no color. So if you want color, you're gonna have to gel the light. And then in the menu of all these lights, we have control over the fan speed, but I have a sub note on that that I'll get to in one second. We have control over the dimming curve. So whether you want it to have a linear response or you know ramp up as you get higher towards 100%. Uh, the Bluetooth, because these are controllable over an app, which we'll get to as well. Language, and then version for updating firmware, and you can update the firmware with the app. But to give you an idea of the amount of fan noise that this makes, this is with it on quiet, and I can see, and maybe you can too, the fan is spinning in there, and this is what it sounds like. Right under the microphone, by the way. I can't even hear it here. I have to I have to literally put it to my ear like this close and I'll be able to hear it. Now the chip on the 60 watt as well as the 220 and 320, they're not exactly the same, but they are getting similar results in terms of photometrics. I validated the results that iFootage provides probably in their documentation or the website or whatever when these lights come out. I validated with my C800 and I'll do a test and share that with you as well. But there are some differences in terms of the the firmware and a little bit on the controlling because the 220 and the 320 use this control box and I don't have the latest firmware for these yet because the ones they sent me are pre-production and they weren't able to get the firmware updates so they actually have to send me new control boxes that are going to be like the ones that the consumers would get that can that can update the firmware. I do have one minor complaint though regarding fans and it has to do with the control unit iFootage has a fan on the bottom of the control unit that also makes a little bit of noise, which is something that first generation lights of a lot of these brands had, and then they moved away from it from their second generation, something that I appreciate on Aperture. So I'm hoping that maybe future, if iFootage makes gen two of these lights, you know, in the future, that maybe they can look to see, you know, maybe make the, the control box a little bit bigger and use a passive uh, cooling system, just so you don't have to have that fan you don't have to calculate where am I going to put the control box, where am I going to put the light head, that kind of thing, because you only have the one sound source to worry about. That being said, it's not particularly loud. I will turn this light on now and we can talk a little bit about its noise and the controls and that kind of thing. Now one thing you might notice is that even though I just went and plugged the light in, it didn't turn on. And that's because in its current state, these lights don't have a studio mode. You know, one of those settings where you can have the light turn on or off automatically just with power being provided versus needing to physically turn it on. This can be handy if you like to run your things through a separate power source or turn it off if you are at home and you don't want it to turn on if say your power turns on and off or you reset the breaker or whatever. So we've got the fan settings, we've got the dimming curve just like with the other light. We've got the Bluetooth controls again for the app. We've got DMX because there is a DMX port on the top here which is this sort of smaller three pin little limo style connector up here, and then language and restore settings. Now before we move on to the photometrics, which are excellent on these lights, I do have to make a couple more complaints about the control box, which I think is probably the weakest point of all these lights is the control box for the 320 and 220. The dial here that you use to adjust everything is, it's not great. I, I don't just wanna make frivolous complaints about it, but compared to other dials I've used, there's often times where your thumb kind of slips and it doesn't completely turn the way you want it to. It just, it doesn't turn nicely is how, how, I don't really know how else to describe it if I'm trying to give notes to the manufacturer to make it better. And the only other thing, if I were to be nitpicky, is I kind of wish that one of the power cables, the one that went to the wall was coming out of the bottom and the one that went to light was coming to the top. That way you'd have sort of a, a flow and you wouldn't have, you know, multiple cords kind of tangled up together at the top. That being said, the cord lengths are excellent. The one that goes from the control box to the light head is like three meters or 10 feet long. So that's plenty if you wanted to, have the control box on the floor and have the light, you know, 10 feet in the air. And the one that goes from the control box to the wall is even longer. It's like almost five meters or 16 feet long. And they're high quality cables with locking connectors on them. So no complaints about that. Good length, good quality cables, and they come with Velcro cable ties as well. I should also mention these little lights before we move on to the rest of the tests. These are HL1, C4, little pocket LED lights, although you know, bad choice here. They sent me the, the green one and the yellow one, and it clearly shows that there's a purple one. They didn't send that one to me. Anyway, full RGB, little pocket lights, similar to what you'd expect from like an Aperture MC. It's got a, a similar little display on them there. You can adjust, you can put them in CCT mode, you can put them in Hue mode, cycle through them. You know, you've seen these little pocket lights before, there's not much to say about them. They have a removable 
shoe things. So you could put them into the hot shoe of your camera or you could just take it off and attach it with a quarter 20 wherever you wanted. Controls are good. They've got a rugged sort of rubber outside. They're a fine little pocket LED. Don't have much to say about them. But if you were, say, shopping for the big lights and you're like, you know, I need a pocket LED while I'm at it, well then, they've got a couple of those for you to choose from as well. Four different colors, I think, including black. I'll also mention about the carrying cases real quick, because this is another exception. I have the one here for the 60 watt, but I don't have the ones yet for the 220 and the 320. But I'll do a, but they're sending, they're on the way to me, so I'll do a quick test to make sure that they're, they're fine. And then I will insert some in the video now from Future Gerald, let you know what I think of the cases. Okay, so it's Future Gerald here. It's a couple weeks later. I've got new control boxes that were shipped to me from iFootage. This one and the other one, I think they're both the final retail versions now instead of prototypes. And I've got it connected to the 220D over here. And I'll just tell you about a few of the improvements. So the dial is now much more tactile and it's not as stubborn as the other one was. I wouldn't say that it's perfect, but I would say it's definitely in the passable good zone now instead of worrisome like the other one. So that's great to see. That's not an issue, power button's not an issue. Uh, we still have a fan on the bottom of the control box though, and that doesn't seem like it's going away anytime soon. Uh, but the fan modes are now updated on the 220 and 320. So let's turn on the light here, and as you can see, I'm running at 100%. And right now the fan mode, as you can see, is on auto. Now look at the light behind me, and you can see that it's full blast. Now the fan is not running yet, so auto means that once it reaches a certain temperature based on a temperature sensor on the heat sink, I think, in the light, it will turn on the fan as necessary and will ramp up the fan as the temperature rises intuitively from, I think, only a couple hundred RPM up to 3000 RPM if you really need it. Now I have noticed that in this climate controlled studio setting, I was running this light on 100% for maybe 10, 15 minutes before the fan actually kicked on and then it only kicked on at a low speed. So you might be able to get away with never hearing the fan even at 100%. However, if you want to make sure the fan is on a quiet setting, like a low RPM all the time, then you can come in here and change this fan mode to quiet by just pressing this button. But watch the light behind me when I do press it. You see how the light behind me just got dimmer? And if we go back to the intensity, you can see it's at 40%. Now, if we can increase the light from here, and if we do increase it back up to 100%, now when we go look at the fan, we'll see it set the fan back to auto. So you can sort of smartly switch between them. But if you just set it to quiet, it'll cap it at 40%. And if you change the intensity lower than 40%, like this, and then go into the menu, it still stays on quiet. And that will make it so the fan can never exceed a certain RPM. Now there's one more fan mode, which is ultra quiet, this one. Now you'll see the light got even dimmer behind me, and that's because if we go to intensity, it's at the 25%, and the fan will not run. So if you're at 25% or lower, and you set it to ultra quiet, the fan will never come on. So that's your silent mode. Now on ultra quiet, you'll see that you can't increase the output past 25%, and that's because the fan is set to off, so you can't exceed 25%. It's only the quiet and auto that kind of have a little fluidity between changing modes based on the output. And something I also like about these lights is how they actually show you the RPM of your fan right up here. It's not completely necessary, but it's nice to know, if you're somebody who likes to know all the information about your products. I also have the cases for the 220 and 320 now which are great. I got, I'm not gonna make a big review out of them. That's the logo, by the way, for the anglerfish. And then inside, this one's mostly empty, but it's got well-formed cutaways for the reflector, your cables, control box, and then the lamp head that goes right here. It's well padded, it's a solid case, looks good, and it's nice and rugged, so. Now I have a whole video on the different light readings and photometrics and what they mean and what's important and what manufacturers are trying to fool you with and what ones you should care about. It's a whole separate video that I did on the Sekonic. I recommend going and check that out if you don't know what these numbers mean, but I'll give you the results now. This is basically just to validate what iFootage is saying because they are providing some seriously strong numbers for photometrics for these lights. So let's get a reading. I'd say I'm a just about a meter away. I'm not worried too much about the power. I've already t tested and the, the, the output numbers that they give are accurate. This is more about the, the color quality. So you can see I got around 8,500 lux, around a meter away, but I am getting a 0.5 green correction requirement, but I have found that it doesn't seem to look particularly bad on the skin tones. You don't, you can't really notice it. And again, I'll show you those in a minute. Now, when we actually get into the color, as I explained in my Sekonic video, CRI is one that doesn't really matter that much, but I got about 98, which I think is what iFootage said. So validated that. And then for the TLCI, you get a ridiculous result of 99. And in some cases on these lights at certain power settings, you can get 100 TLCI. Again, probably not the best 
measurement source for this, but the TM30 is a good one to check. And this one shows you, like I, like I said, watch that video if you want to know more, but basically this circle, you probably can't even tell that both circles are overlapping perfectly. That means that all the colors for both hue and saturation are pretty well lined up. And you can see right here, it's getting a 98 in terms of, you know, are the colors right? And 101 in terms of saturation, that means it's just slightly oversaturated, just but 1% oversaturated. If both these numbers were 100, it would be perfect. It's darn near perfect. And then SSI is another one that's good. This tells you how well this light matches a known source. And as we can see here, if we're matching it to daylight, which is what these lights are, then we get an 84, which you can see on the SSI. Basically what that means is it's getting a score of 84 when compared to perfect actual daylight. And you can compare this to tungsten, that kind of thing as well. This is the highest I've ever seen for an SSI of a light that's been sent to me. Normally, for if you want to score in the 80s, you have to compare it to tungsten. You have to do, use a tungsten light. But for daylight, you're normally only in the 70s. And I can prove this by just turning off this light and turning on the key light that I use. And if I just take a reading right here, you can see that the aperture light scored a 75, which up to this point we consider to be, you know, that's what you get with a daylight COB. But these eye footage lights are pulling an 84, so they're going to be much better for daylight. And what we can see by this is if we look at the, the chart here on the aperture light, you see, so the red boxes are correct daylight. You see how the, the COBs generally have a problem with blue? These blue channels are way too high and out of whack. But on the eye footage light, you can see that we are so much closer to the red boxes and the blues aren't that much higher. That's great. If you're looking for a light that more closely matches daylight as a source, these eye footage lights are the best I've ever tested for that. Let's talk for a quick second about the app while I have it here. So this is the Anglerfish app. Uh, and as you can see, we've got the 220 here. And if I added the 320 and 60, they would just appear in boxes below. And then we have all devices here. It's very intuitive, the app works easily. This little toggle here, if I tap that, turns the light off, tap it again, turns the light on, and you can also turn on and off the entire project up here, which would be all of the lights in the box below. The cog there is for a firmware update. It pairs extremely quickly, which I like as well. There is a difference in the 220 and 320, it has to do with the, the yoke system. So on the 220, as you can see, it's just a simple, you know, wing nut style thing here. And inside, there is an umbrella holder that you can see right there. The yoke on this one is strong enough, I found, for their light modifiers. It does require you to tight it, qu tighten it quite a bit, but it does do the job, but it is more of a smaller style, you know, yoke, uh, but all metal parts. But the 320 has the, but the 320 has the larger style one that is capable of fully, you know, going around the light. So if you're worried about doesn't have that issue at all. So it goes 360 all the way around the light and it provides plenty of clearance here and uses a heavy duty handbrake style lock for it. All metal, well made, but no umbrella holder on this one. Okay, so just for consistency, let's jack up the power on the 60 watt here and then shine it and let's take a quick reading of that. Okay, so as you can see, again, I'm still not getting quite 5600 Kelvin, 54 something, and not as big of a correction required for green, only 0.3 100%. And then I'm getting about 5700 lux at roughly a meter away. I didn't really measure it. SSI is 84 again, just like we measured before, and 98 again on the CRI. So very consistent across the lights here, and that's what the SSI spectrum looks like. So again, really good control over those blues there. Now let's shine it on my face. Okay, so this is the first little test shot here. I've got no modifiers on that light at all, not even the reflector, it's just a bare chip. And I'm at 9.3% on the app and I'm using the app and it's working well. And I've got just a couple little subjects here on the secondary camera. The white balance is not changing. They're locked on the camera so that, you know, what you see is what you get as we go through so you can see the difference in the light. And the color quality, as you can see, is fantastic. And yeah, my skin is maybe a slight bit pinker because of that green correction that's required because I've corrected our lights for that. Now there is an advantage in having a brand new light start this way because uh, LEDs tend to green up over time. So you'd rather have them start needing a little bit of green correction and then once you break the light in, it'll land more in that zero spot. So being a little bit magenta up front is a good thing. Now these colors look good and you know, I'm reasonably happy with this. I didn't want to put any modifiers until you could see what the skin tones look like. Obviously it's really spotty. Okay, so now I'm just going to take the Bowen's adapter thing for the 60 watt and an umbrella because there's an umbrella holder on the Bowen's adapter. There isn't one on the light normally. I'm attached to the 60 watt and see what that looks like 
looks light looks like saying light too much and see uh, how it looks with, with a bit of a cheap modifier if you will behind it. Let's turn this back off. Okay and so now I'm behind an umbrella and the umbrella is probably about a the umbrella itself is about a meter and a half away and the light is behind that so we're at quite a distance for a small light like that and then the umbrella the umbrella might change the the color a little bit so we can't exactly factor in it. it depends on what umbrella you're using. That's why I did the first test of the modifiers. But let's just give you an idea of like you know what kind of really cost effective sort of light shaping that you can do as a bit of a key light. Colors still look pretty good. Again, I'm noticing a slight temperature change since putting the umbrella on, but give me one second. So that's with the rest of the lights, and then if we just adjust the intensity of the 60 watt, I'd say somewhere around there, do it quick, that's 56%, so just over half power, and then I put my regular lights on, but the other lights that I use in front of me aren't on at all. So to give you an idea, this is off, that's, that's all the accessory lights, and then that's just the eye footage, 60 watt through an umbrella. But I think it looks pretty good, and like I said, overall, I'm really happy with these lights, especially that 60 watt. I'm kind of obsessed with it. I think, like, like I said, when it comes to quality per dollar, I don't think there's a better 60 watt light on the market if you're looking for just something small for, you know, a little home studio work, or even just as like a kicker or something. It's a really, really good light. And if you need more power, the 220 and 320s offer the same high SSI, great daylight reliability as the other ones for a really good price with really great build quality. Again, better build quality than you should that you, you would normally expect from that price point. So this is a really good lineup and a really good entry into the lighting from iFootage, and I'm excited to see where they take it. Possible notes for the future: I would love to see a studio mode on these lights that turns on and off when you provide power automatically. And if there's going to be V2s of these lights, I'd like to see sort of an updated control box in the 220 and 320 that maybe gets rid of the fan, spruces up the dial a little bit. But other than that, this is a really, really impressive first step into lighting from iFootage. Good job. All right, I'm done.